take us off record. Okay, we are interviewing uh, Judge Vidati and she is running for election as municipal court judge. Uh, feel free to give us your introduction. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for giving me your time tonight. Uh, my name is Pooja Vidati. I'm running for judicial position three in Seattle Municipal Court and I'm respectfully asking for your recommendation for an endorsement. Uh, I'm a first generation Indian American, child of immigrants and a Washington native and a career public defender. For my entire life, the only career that's ever called to me has been service through the law. And I'm running in Seattle for a judge in order to help and serve the community that raised me and to become the first South Asian woman elected to this bench. I'm a Washington native, as I mentioned, I've lived here for most of my life. And now I live with my husband in Seattle with our two cats, Stella and Thor. Um, when I was growing up, I traveled back and forth to India and it was really seeing the stark economic divide there that kind of compelled me to begin my lifetime of service. Uh, why I'm running for this particular position uh, is because I've practiced in that court for about 10 months before I announced my campaign. And I realized that what's happening right now in Seattle and particularly in municipal court is absolutely not working. Misdemeanor crime in Seattle is at an all time high. It's driven by such factors of poverty, chronic homelessness and untreated mental illness. Seattle Municipal Court, in my opinion, is positioned to do a great deal to mitigate all of those factors through restorative justice programs and through the fair administration of the law. But at least for the last few years, they've failed in that mandate. Among other things, the court has fallen in line with the priorities of the city attorney and such policies like the High Utilizer Initiative, which is basically a rebrand of other failed policy that the city attorney has been trying over and over again and has not really worked to alleviate any of the problems facing Seattle. Even some of the restorative justice programs that are in Seattle often ring hollow. Uh, for example, the DVIP program, which is a well-meaning program, is exclusionary by design. The requirements for that program prevent access by those who need it most. In effect, it's really only available for uh, straight men and well-off straight men. 10 seconds, or uh, that's time, sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you for your time. Great, um, so we're gonna move to uh, pre-prepared questions and we'll just kind of um, you know take turns uh, asking you questions for the first. Laura, do you wanna take the first question? What are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Sure, as I mentioned, I am a career public defender. Um, I've practiced in different courts all over the state of Washington. I've practiced in the Snohomish County Courts, a um, couple different King County Courts, and I've even had some minor experience with the Superior Court in Pierce County in my first, in my first job uh, out, right out of law school. I have a lot of trial experience. I am pretty well versed in criminal law in particular, which is exactly what Seattle Municipal Court deals with. And um, as I mentioned, I've got a lot of trial experience, so about 11 years of trial experience. Uh, I believe that my background as a public defender does qualify me for your endorsement, as I do see that the 36th LD and a lot of the Democratic organizations do care a lot about restorative justice do care a lot about the fair administration of justice. And I believe that my work as a public defender has very much um, been towards, you know, helping the community in that manner and trying to give everybody a fair shake at the system. Uh, I believe that a lot of you do recognize that the system has failed the most vulnerable people. And I've seen that, I've experienced it. I've fought very hard for my clients to try to do what I can to stand in between you know, this one individual person and the great power of the state and the city attorney or the prosecuting attorney and the judge. And I've felt helpless sometimes as a defense attorney. And I, I would like to, I would like to do something about that, which is why I'm really doing this right now. And I think just knowing what the community of Seattle really desperately needs, as I mentioned, I've worked with them um, and I've heard from their families the community of the victims, everybody. And, and I think that just knowing what each individual really wants does qualify me for this particular position as well. Great, thank you. Um, question number two, Barbara, do you wanna take that one? Okay. So um, in what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? Sure, and 
Um, can I ask just a clarifying question? When you say civil actions, do you mean all kinds of civil suits or particularly what Seattle Municipal Court deals with, which is mostly weddings and civil protection orders? I, I, I would stick exactly to the business of Seattle Municipal Court. I apologize, but some of these questions are um, slightly more general than your the position you're interviewing for. Sure, no problem. I can I can do my best there. Um, Seattle Municipal Court deals with mostly, at least as a judge, I would only really be presiding over the uh, misdemeanor offenses, some civil protection orders as well as weddings. Uh, but Seattle Municipal Court does also still deal with traffic infractions. Um, so I think maybe we can talk about that in terms of civil action. Although I won't be presiding over it, I do recognize that traffic infractions can actually be a significant burden to those people who are of lower or no financial means. And I've had a lot of clients who have had a lot of FTAs on traffic tickets, thus suspending their license. And so I think what the courts can really do to mitigate that is to give people who do pick up traffic infractions a bit of a financial break, take some understanding, maybe divert those infractions into something that's a little bit more productive. I, I recognize that that's something that sometimes a judge may only get to deal with in municipal court once it does become the suspended license kind of situation. Um, and I've respected a lot of the judges in this court that do give their defendants a break in terms of the fines, because that can be the first step to putting somebody kind of back. Um, and so the courts can better serve to recognize that not everybody can pay the $500 fine, <laughs> give people payment plans, give people an opportunity to take some other action, maybe that's not necessarily financial in terms of showing a respect for the traffic infraction that they've broken, but still allow them to keep their license, still allow them to not go in debt forever um, over a traffic infraction. I hope that answered your question as best as I could. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, question number three, Alice, do you wanna take that one? Sure. If presiding over a criminal docket, what role do you think judges should take and what would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as drug court, mental health court, and other diversion programs or other alternatives to incarceration? I think a judge is sometimes the one person who can really advocate for diversion programs and advocate for individuals to be put in these diversion programs. Unfortunately, Seattle Municipal Court doesn't have drug court. Um, and really the only diversion program that's for these kinds of areas is mental health court and veterans court. I would really like to expand the reach that these programs have. Um, I've had experience with individuals who have been in mental health court and are, the court was not set up well enough through all of the treatment alternatives to actually help people with very significant needs. Um, it's, it's better served for people who maybe have functional mental illnesses. And so I would really love to expand the reach that the Seattle Municipal Court has in terms of mental health court. It would be amazing if there could be a drug court alternative as well in Seattle Municipal Court, as you know, a lot of people do divert into misdemeanor court before heading into superior court. Um, and so I do think that a role should take, or a judge should take the role of encouraging the city attorney and the defense attorney to work towards diverting the defendants into these diversion programs. And especially in misdemeanor court, I, I think there should be an emphasis on trying to help the people in there because there's an opportunity here. There's no minimum sentence that somebody needs to be sentenced to after they've been convicted of a crime. There's, there's an opportunity here to deal with somebody who maybe you know, we can, you can get them without having to send them to prison exactly. and you have city money here. So I, I would like there to be more programs and more opportunities in this court. And I think Seattle Municipal Court judges are very <laughs> well situated for it. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna move to the fourth question and I'll take that one. Uh, what is your position on bail reform? What factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail and what, tra uh, what changes would you ad advocate for, if any, if elected? 
I, I think bail reform is much needed. Um, there are a lot of places, I think particularly a brand new study came out actually um, in one of the Texas courts that showed that a very comprehensive bail reform um, can actually reduce recidivism, can actually reduce crime and does actually save the money, city quite a bit of money. Um, and so I'm a big fan of bail reform. I think right now the way it's implemented in these courts is more punitive uh, rather than geared at ensuring some public safety. I have seen it very poorly implemented when it comes to nominal bail. Um, the term nominal bail, if you're not familiar with it, is it's supposed to be something that is very minimal, um, almost like a placeholder type bail, but a lot of the times nominal bail is imposed on those who don't have the means to post even a dollar. And so it ends up just being punitive and demonstrative representative of just their needing to be a bail imposed on somebody. Um, but then you end up with an individual who can't post it. And so I would really try to deter judges from imposing a nominal bail on somebody who's making a representation that they don't have the financial means to do that. Um, I, I've seen bail imposed at $25 in this court, um, and I would definitely 100% encourage my colleagues to not ever do that uh, because nominal bail, in my opinion, is not does not um, prevent people or deter people from committing offenses. For somebody that $100 means nothing, they're not gonna be motivated to not commit new crimes or not violate that no contact exactly. order that's been imposed. But for somebody who has no money, they're stuck in jail. Um, and so I think it's just, it does not take into account the socioeconomic differences between each individual that goes into the into the jail. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to e-board questions. And again, sure. you have one minute to answer uh, questions. Um, so I, um, I wanna open that up to e-board. Uh, questions. Barbara, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you, um, in your opening statement, said that something is really wrong with the municipal court and that you've seen, you've just seen over and over examples of people just not being treated correctly. Um, so I'm not a le in the legal world at all. So I'm going, I just want to ask you, could you describe one of those cases that you saw or that you represented that was just handled or dealt with or the outcome was really wrong and just maybe uh, try to explain to me why it, what was wrong about it? Sure. Um, I'm going to have to be a little bit vague as there will be. Yeah, you please, please be vague. Just, yeah. just kind of give me a sense of what sure. you were thinking when you uh, said those words. Sure. I was actually thinking of very one particular incident. I was covering the jail calendar. And so what happens there is people are arrested on warrants or on new crimes and they need to be arraigned. Uh, the particular individual that I represented on that day was a very, um, was he was arrested on a community court warrant. I believe it was for a criminal trespass, so a nonviolent offense. Um, the situation was he'd missed court maybe three, four times before. Um, and the warrant that was issued was a $25 warrant. Um, he'd been picked up on other charges, but they'd been dismissed or his bail went away for whatever reason. And the only bail that was keeping him in jail right now was $25. Uh, the story that this individual told me was that he had just secured housing and he was about 24, 24 hours um, into his check-in deadline, which was about 48 hours. If he did not get out that day, he was going to miss his deadline and he was going to lose his housing. We begged with the court to release him. The prosecutor was not objecting for his release, nor his ob objecting to his admittance into community court. And the judge, despite my client getting down on his knees and begging, still imposed a $25 bail on him. And he didn't have that amount of money. And I'm not allowed to post it for him, nor is any attorney. Um, and the judge actually said, talk to your attorney. She'll be able to bail you out through the bail fund. And so, and I think the exact words also that she used was you need to have some skin in the game, but talk to your attorney. She can get you out through the bail fund. Great. Um, that's, a, that's a very, very vivid example. I, uh, I appreciate it very much. 
Thank you. Uh, next question, Laura. What do you think the biggest challenge or challenges at the Seattle Municipal Court are currently and how would you work to address those challenges? Uh, I, the, one of the biggest challenges, I think, at least as I've seen it while I was practicing there is um, it seems that the bench as it's situated right now um, is sort of fallen in line with the city attorney and the, the way they advocate for um, people to be excluded from diversion programs. And so I, as I see it right now, there is one judge currently advocating still for people to be eligible off the high utilizer initiative um, to remain eligible for diversion programs like community courts. And if elected, I would like to add my voice to that as well to encourage the city attorney and the courts to allow people into diversion programs that have these I guess the best expression for it is the revolving door of the criminal justice system, right? You have these repeat offenders, these repeat individuals that you see over and over again. Um, and something that I've recognized and that the stranger has actually done a really good job at finding out is that a lot of the people on that high utilizer list are, um, are mm -hmm. not, have not, sorry, have not been eligible for the diversion programs. And so um, I would like to challenge that, and I would like to add those people back into eligibility for these diversion programs. Great, thank you. We have time for maybe one, one or two questions. Anybody else? Any other questions? Well, I'll ask a question. So, um, what um, what do you, you're very, very passionate about things needing to be changed at the court based on what you've seen. Could you tease that out a little bit and tell us how your election and your presence on the court um, what can you do immediately? What, you know, how, how do you, what, what are the mechanisms by which you would address those things that you've described very vividly? Well, I'll, I'll be honest, change is going to not happen very quickly, but I would love to take action immediately to expand the programs that are currently there, the, the diversion programs. The, Domestic violence intervention program is a great start, but as I've mentioned, it has, it is only accessible for straight men. I would like to speak with organizations in the LGBTQ plus community, um, women's rights organizations, and figure out a way to also make it eligible to all people who um, are perpetrators of and victims of domestic violence. It's a great opportunity because it's not just straight men who commit these of acts of violence, and it's not just straight women who are victims of them. Um, and so expanding access would be the first it's step to it. Um, and I, I also would love to add my voice to, to encouraging the city attorney and the other judges to expand access to community court. So I guess, I guess Barbara, my, my biggest thing is to expand access. I, I think it's very limited right now, and it's not helping most of Seattle's vulnerable population. Can I ask you a clarification, Ethan, is there time? I'll, sure. I'll yeah, go ahead. So um, how do these, are these programs funded at a certain level by the city um, budget? I mean, expand access means do more dollars for something. And don't, wouldn't it have to be budgeted uh, to provide more access? Um, just help me out on that. Is it really at the legal level or is it a budgeting level or um, what, who's holding the gate closed here or what's holding the gate closed? So it, it will be a budgeting issue and the city council would be responsible for granting more money to the municipal court. But if I'm being perfectly honest, I don't think that it's really at this point a money issue. I think it's I, I think it's even just putting in the effort to try to even just communicate with these organizations that I don't know if they've been communicated with in terms of 
any of the victims' rights for the LGBTQ plus community, for example, or um, or any of the women's rights communities. I, I'm I am concerned that there has been a uniform way to approach things in this court, um, and that expanding access exactly. may even just be as much as trying to change the parameters of a program that may not need more money to, to do it. It might just be that you need different types of counselors or you need a different curriculum in these programs. It might even just be that you need to even just reach out to these organizations and see if they wish to participate and donate their time. And so I, and I find it hard to believe that there's not been an LGBTQ plus organization or a women's victim rights organization that didn't want to participate in these programs. And, and I would like to explore even just the idea of seeing if they do it in the current budget that's allotted right now. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we're gonna move to the closing statement just for the sake of time. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, it sounds good. You have one minute. Thank you. Um, so if it's not already apparent, the core of my campaign platform is restorative justice which means a focus on rehabilitation and reconciliation with the community, a focus on ending patterns of abuse that cause recidivism and granting offenders and their families and the community the opportunities that are necessary for them to re-enter into society. Compassion and fairness mean that understanding that every defendant, witness and victim is a human being with their own challenges and struggles. And as a career public defender, I spent years learning to see and to understand the struggles of mental illness poverty and desperation that impact Seattle's most vulnerable. I have the experience to understand why it's so important to check our biases so that outcomes are never dictated by such factors as race, gender, or socioeconomic status, but instead in accordance with the law guided by compassion That's and amazing. fairness. And with that, <laughs> I respectfully again ask for your recommendation for the endorsement. Great. I'm going to take this off for